fresh meat. Imagine the perfect video store. It would have a great selection, right? Right. Over 10,000 videos. Three evening rentals, so no rush, no hassle. Kids today will just not understand the joy of discovering a film like we used to. Movies would sometimes go to the theater and not grab a lot of attention, but once they hit the video store, it was often found because of the cool cover art. Something in that artwork would make you pick it up and read the back of the box. Even if it didn't tell you a whole lot about the movie, that cover art would entice you to rent it to see if it lived up to that promise. For those that were lucky enough to grow up with cable, you might hear that a certain film was playing late at night on one of the movie channels. Maybe you read it in your trusty TV guide, a whole magazine built around telling you what time stuff would be on TV. It's funny how now that seems like a weird concept, but you'd have to sneak downstairs when everyone was asleep to see if you could watch the entire film without your parents finding out. Keeping the volume low, sitting as close to the TV as you could, these two options are how an entire generation discovered the movie Warlock. For those who didn't see it, let's discuss it here on Best Horror Movie You Never Saw. In the late 80s, screenwriter David Toohey had an idea to write about a man from the 17th century that fled the time period to avoid religious persecution, only to find himself still persecuted in present day. After a few months of trying to get the idea to work, he had to completely rework the script and change the man into the villain of the piece. From there, Warlock was born. I want to thank you guys for watching the best horror movie you never saw and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like the video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. In the film, we open Boston, 1691. In a large tower, we see the titular warlock chained up. He has a particular set of cuffs on him that locks his thumbs and his big toes together, keeping him bent over. I, I understood that reference. He has a chance to confess his sins before he is executed, but declines. As the witch hunter that caught him, Redfern, checks on him again. He sees that the warlock is performing a spell. The warlock disappears, and Redfern goes after him into the spell. The warlock arrives in present day 1990 Los Angeles by crashing through the window of a house. Cassandra and Chaz, Cassandra's live-in landlord, find the blonde man passed out. Oh, what the heck are these? Hey, don't touch him. Let the cops do that stuff. They let him sleep, and the next morning after Cassandra leaves her work, he kills Chaz. She returns to the house to get her belongings, but is confronted by Redfern. After some back and forth and complete misunderstandings, Redfern gets caught by the police just as the warlock arrives back at the house. We've learned that he's after parts of a book called the Grand Grimoire. With this book, the warlock shall learn the name of God. If he speaks it backward, then creation itself will be unmade. He finds a section of the book inside an antique table Chaz has owned. Cassandra tries to escape, but is instead cursed by the warlock before he leaves after he takes possession of one of her bracelets. Out your callow life in dismay, rentum osculum tormentum, a decade twice over a day. When she wakes up, she finds that she has aged 20 years overnight. She goes to get Redfern out of jail as they start to track down the warlock. Redfern tells her that she'll age 20 years a day until she dies. They decide they have to track down the warlock and stop him from assembling the Grand Grimoire and regain Cassandra's bracelet, which should reverse the aging spell. Interestingly, this movie showcases the talents of Julian Sands as the warlock. His presence and charisma make him a great villain. Most people are easily charmed by him, which makes them lower their defenses around him. He's able to use this to his advantage when engaging with people they don't suspect his evil intentions until it's too late. The interesting thing is that Julian Sands almost ignored the script for this movie when it came across his desk. He figured it would just be another slasher horror movie that was popular at the time, and it sat around for a while before he finally read it. Once he did, he became very excited about the film and all the great acting moments in the script. He was captivated by the story of the warlock and the time travel aspect of it which presented a man out of time component which would be fun to play. 
Originally, Julian Sands was considered for the part of Redfern and Richard E. Grant, who is getting a lot of love right now, playing old Loki in the Loki series was considered for the part of the Warlock. When director Steve Miner came on board, he thought it would be fun to switch them up, and this ended up being a perfect idea as Sands' Warlock is so devilishly evil that it makes you love him and Grant's Redfern is so single-minded in his pursuit that you can see that he takes his job as a witch hunter seriously. This determination makes his character a great foil for the Warlock and helps when a few comedic beats come through to play against his super serious persona. Can I take that for you? Over my rotting corpse. <laughs> Family heirloom. <laughs> they turn here, here. Hey, look, pal. I know this town pretty good. I lived here since 1958. How about you? Don't answer that. The film itself isn't overly gory, but some scenes did end up getting cut as they seemed too gruesome or possibly causing too much controversy at the time. In a scene that was deleted, the warlock meets up with a young boy, and after having a back and forth, the villain learns that the boy is unbaptized. They cut this to our heroes, showing up in the town to find the boy had been killed and blamed on local Meet coyotes. Coyote, Roger, huh? The boy over at Trailer Park was killed by one. They do that sometimes. Kyle will come down and drag off a small child. The boy is fairly well chewed up from what's being said, skin taken clean. In reality, the boy had been killed to do a spell that would allow the warlock to fly. Originally, there was a scene that showed what happened to the boy. The filmmakers decided it was too gruesome and cut it from the film, leaving the boy's actual death in the mind of the audience. And it would seem that was a good idea, as in 1995, a teenage boy and his eight-year-old accomplice had been inspired by this film and killed their seven-year-old classmate. As in the film, they stripped off sections of his skin, believing that if they made a potion with it, they would be able to fly. Sadly, even in his truncated form, this still inspired these young men. Movies are supposed to be fun. Let's keep it that way, folks. The other big thing that was deleted from the theatrical version was in a scene shown in the original trailer that indicated the warlock would be the satanic messiah. Well, you're the first to have lain eyes upon the new messiah. Not sure why this ended up being taken out, but they could have just wanted to avoid any issues with church officials boycotting the film. In reality, the films that get boycotted by the church usually end up doing much better at the box office. This could have been missed opportunity. Interestingly, this plot point would end up being part of the sequel. Trimark distributed this film theatrically, but the film was finished in 1988 as one of the last films for New World Pictures during their bankruptcy. It was held for a few years as Trimark bought it and any sequel rights. Julian Sands would return for the sequel Warlock 2, The Armageddon, but would not come back for the third film Warlock 3, The End of Innocence. While the characters may appear similar, the three Warlocks in the films are all different characters and have no relation to the ones in previous films. This sort of plays out like the Leprechaun movies. Same monster, but not exact same monster. Now, who wants a Leprechaun versus Warlock film? Someone get Julian Sands and Warwick Davis on the phone. <laughs> Uh, mainstay in the video stores and cable channels of the 90s, Warlock has held up pretty well as a horror film from the same time period. Slasher films had overtaken the horror genre at the time this was made, and it was refreshing to see a return to supernatural horror with life-ending stakes. Sands and Grant both play their parts perfectly and give the audience a fun adventure through time, magic, and evil itself. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate your support. If you have any suggestions for future episodes, please leave them in the comments below.